Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. So I was recently asked to read an audiobook, a sci-fi novel written by a guy named Lee Berveen. Now, I get a ton of requests to do a lot of wonderful stuff, and I'm so honored for those requests, but it's hard to manage them. I have to say no to most of them just for, for time reasons. The fact that there's just not enough bandwidth to get it done, you know. So he sends me this manuscript, and he said, Lawrence Krauss wrote the foreword. Okay, now you've got my attention. It's a sci-fi novel, but it has tons of secular themes and commentary about religious belief. A lot of stuff there in the subtext. And it's cleverly done, and it doesn't bat you over the head either, you know. And I read the book, and I immediately said, okay, I'm totally in. And so I've been in the studio for the past several days reading the first, I think I've got the first 12 chapters in the can, reading this audio book. And I think... The book itself and the audiobook officially release late spring, early summer, sometime mid-2016, I think. When it happens, in case you're interested, I'll make sure and make a lot of noise about it on the social media pages and, and let you know what's out there. But it's uh, it's been kind of cool. You know, it's different not reading a, a nonfiction book, you know, to read a novel and to get into the characters and to actually enjoy the story as you're telling it to someone else. It's been an interesting experience. It's been a lot of fun to be a part of. Anyway, that's been happening, and it should release in just a few short months. I was kind of bummed to hear that uh, Richard Dawkins isn't going to make the Reason Rally this year. They just made that announcement a few days ago. He had this uh, hemorrhagic stroke in February. He's supposed to make a full recovery. Dawkins is 74 years old. And I guess he's lost some motor function, but he's supposed to be on the mend. But the doctor said no travel. And so he had to cancel his speaking slot at the Reason Rally. It's still going to be an amazing day, though. And I'm going to be there with a camera. I hope I get a chance to see you. Now, that's June the 4th, Lincoln Memorial. You can go to ReasonRally.org to find out more about that. Real fast on the podcast roster for April. Next Tuesday was going to be our homeschool cults show. Prepping this show was fascinating and maddening at the same time. But there was so much stuff to talk about that I've decided to split that broadcast into two shows. So April 5th and April 12th will both be parts one and two of Homeschool Cults. As we get into the curriculum, the stuff they're teaching these poor minnows, the organizations and people behind it, like Bob Jones University and Bill Gothard and the recent Gothard scandal. And then we're going to talk to people who've run this gauntlet and come out the other side and become critics of fundamentalist homeschooling. I'm going to get into uh, the Duggar family, the Duggar family scandal. I'm going to highlight a conversation with Vicki Garrison, who escaped the Quiverful movement, which is huge into fundamentalist homeschooling. We're going to talk about organizations that are advocating for these kids and trying to go and prevent this insanity from happening in the future. Groups like Homeschoolers Anonymous. There was so much stuff, I just thought, let's do two shows, April 5th and 12th. And then later on in April, this is just interesting, on the 26th, I think, I have lined up a broadcast called The Mind Virus. Is religion a virus of the mind? I think so. I've got three psychiatrists and psychologists, a panel of mental health experts on the show. We're going to talk about how you catch this virus, how you prevent this virus, how you cure this virus. Religion, the mind virus. I've got uh, Dr. Daryl Ray. I've got Dr. Valerie Tarico and Dr. Andy Thompson lined up for that sucker. That's coming up near the end of April. So mark it on your calendar because it should be interesting stuff. Tonight's broadcast is called Skeptical Youth. I never expected to, in some ways, become my parents. 
I mean, in some ways, we're polar opposites. Theologically speaking, philosophically speaking, we are different nations. We are not even in the same zip code. We're just way opposite. But in other ways, I do catch myself from time to time saying the kind of stuff that parents say to young people. And then I stop and I think, how did this happen? I was young. Five minutes ago, it seems. I just, I was, you know, I, I had boundless energy. I had a size 30 waist. My hairline hadn't receded one centimeter. I could eat pizza at every meal. I was carefree. You know, the world was my oyster. I was invincible. I was young. And then today, you know, I had somebody ask me the other day if I wanted to go to a concert. And granted, in my youth, I was going to concerts all the time. I'd camp out for tickets. Four o'clock in the morning, it's 20 degrees outside. You're camped out. You're bundled up waiting for the shop to open at 1030 or 11 to get your concert tickets, right? Somebody asked me, I can't even remember the artist. You want to go to this concert? Someone else is going. They've got extra tickets. And I actually had this situational scenario play out in my mind all right what day is it okay finish work and then i'm gonna change we're gonna get dressed into some relatively nice clothes and then we're gonna drive what the concert's downtown gotta find a parking space jeez parking downtown is a total pain in the ass i'm gonna go and then how long is the concert who's opening for them that's two and a half three hours maybe three and a half if they go really long let's say we get out of there at 11 Got to get back to the parking lot. Got to get out of the traffic. Out of there is going to be just insane. I may not get home till after midnight. You know, um, let's just stay home and watch TV. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm good with that. Let's stay home and watch The Americans, honey. It's a show we just got hooked on. There was, uh, we've got Amazon Prime. It's funny, we ditched Satellite a few years back. And I know some folks who have sort of taken this journey as, oh, I bring it up, I just digress. But, you know, we used to like having the options. We had this satellite dish that brought in tons of television. The problem is we were paying a shit ton of money for it, and we didn't watch hardly any of it. And so we just ditched the whole thing and got one of those little Roku boxes. And it's changed how we we do television. Now it's just, you know, Netflix and Amazon and everything's on demand, right? And it saved us a ton of money. But it's also changed how we watch television. So we got hooked on this show called The Americans, which airs, its first run airs on FX, but the reruns are on Amazon or whatever. And we were looking for something to watch. And so we got got hooked. Season one, season two, we're cranking through season three. We're going to be done with it. And then, oh, shit. Season four is still in its first run, releasing one week at a time on FX. We're going to have to wait. There have been some series. We'll actually wait till the entire series has been produced and released before we start season one, episode one, just so we can binge watch the whole thing if we like it. That's how it's changed. (laughs) And, you know, that's my idea of a Friday night. My idea of a wild night is like drinking a caffeinated beverage. In the evening, kick my feet up on the couch. I got Henry and Rad Dog in my lap. I got Natalie right next to me. We're watching The Americans or whatever. Put a movie in. In bed by 9.45. Of course, I'm usually up around 5.30, but you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I used to be able to stay up all night. I was tireless. I couldn't wait to fill every minute with something to do. And now, now... Now I'm talking like my parents. And I guess in some ways I'm feeling like my parents. You know, I'm going to be 48 in a few days. I'm edging toward the big 5-0. I can just see it coming. Before you know it, bedtime is going to be 9. <laughs> I found this website that had uh, some of those things that our parents used to say. When I was your age, we used to do this. When I was your age, man, we used to do that, and we liked it. And it listed a whole bunch of these, and I just thought they were funny, and I thought that'd be a fun way to open the show today. I'll just throw some of these out. When I was your age, phones actually looked like the phone icon. 
You know, I never thought of it that way, but whenever you see a phone icon representing, hey, telephone here or whatever, it looks nothing like the phones we use. Never occurred to me. When I was your age, gas was only a dollar fifty. When I was your age, we didn't go to Redbox or we didn't download our movies from wherever. We went to the video store and we rented them on VHS or Beta or Laserdisc for some of us. Anybody remember Laserdisc? When I was your age, internet speeds were 128K. And we had to use, what were the big three? AOL, which is still around. AOL, Prodigy, and CompuServe. Anybody use those? I had a CompuServe account, or was it Prodigy? I can't remember. (laughs) Yeah, that was it. And you paid a ton of money for it, too. And I think you paid per minute you were online. You actually had to log on. You didn't stay logged on always. You actually physically had to log on to AOL, Prodigy, or CompuServe. And then the clock started ticking, and you were going to get billed for whatever you used. When I was your age, when we were on family vacations, we didn't have Google Maps. We had to buy paper maps at the gas station and unfold them in the passenger seat of the car and try to read them. When I was your age, our 3D glasses were made of paper. With the red and the blue gel paper or whatever that stuff is in there. When I was your age, when we had to install Windows on our computers, it took like 25 small floppy disks and an entire day to get it done. We had rotary phones. We played records because we simply had no other option. Unless it was 8-track. Our skateboards were made out of wood. We had to bake potatoes in the oven because we did not have microwaves. There's a pain in the ass. You want to bake potato now? You hit the potato button and it's ready. Back then, it's 20 minutes to heat the oven and another hour to cook the damn potato. We didn't have earbuds for our portable music players, which, by the way, did not hold very many songs. We had these big foam earphones with the orange sponges on the side. Yeah. Oh, yeah, those were cool. We actually had to pass physical paper notes in class because we had no texting. You had to actually physically write something down using ink and paper, fold it up, and get it from point A to point B without somebody between A and B deciding it'd be funny to read it and without the teacher discovering you. Our cameras had film. You had to drive them to the photo mat and wait three days to see what your pictures looked like. When I was your age, Ozzy Osbourne was considered controversial. Isn't it funny how today he's just this kind of funny old man? He's just this harmless dude. (laughs) You know, yeah, he starred in the Osbournes, you know. He just seems like the most benign fellow. Back then, Ozzy was the devil. Parents... Religious institutions, whole organizations warned about the damage he was doing to an entire generation. And now we just have to laugh at ourselves and laugh at those who were issuing the warning. Because Ozzy's just, the, he just seems like the sweetest cat ever, right? Of course, if I'm going to be honest, I must say I actually really, really, really envy young people in the year 2016. I wonder what my life would be like if I'd been born in the information age. If I'd had the opportunities and resources afforded to young people today. Would we have seen so much more happen in my lifetime? So while in some ways I am sort of yammering on like my parents, in most ways I I actually am pretty excited about young people, about the opportunities, about the culture that they're in. Yeah, it's far from perfect. Yeah, you'll find the negative examples. But by and large, wouldn't it have been nice when you and I were growing up if somebody had said something from the platform or the podium and we could have immediately done the the homework right there in the seat we're sitting in? We could have begun the research that would have revealed what they said to be either true or false or at least suspicious. We could communicate with anybody and everybody at a second's notice. 
There are people in this audience who remember the frustration of trying to make a phone call to family or friends. Before the invention of call waiting, you had a home phone hardwired into the wall. You call them. You're desperate to get a hold of them. And what do you hear? And you cannot get through. When did call waiting get invented? Early 80s? So before then, you were screwed. And if they were doing a two-hour conversation, it was a nightmare. As you try every five minutes, ah, 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 and you can't get through. Now, not only do you know who's calling, you get a photograph of them because it was retrieved from your Gmail or whatever account. You've got a whole profile of them, their phone number, their email, their address, notes about them, you know, whatever. Uh, it's amazing. Young people today are connected in a way that you and I may never have envisioned. Now, there's a downside to that. You know, I, I'll admit, yeah, I bristle when we're sitting at the table over dinner and I'm eyeball to eyeball with someone, you know, and especially a teenager, you know, one of the kids, and they pull out their phone. And so they're eating with one hand and scrolling and texting with the other. No, 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 no. There comes a point when you're so connected that you're actually disconnected. And there are some interesting articles about sort of the downside of all of this. But by and large, don't you see it as a positive? There's so much stuff to know. There's so much stuff to discover. There's so many things that we have discovered just in the last few decades. It's an amazing time to be starting out your life. Today's show is about skeptical youth, skeptics of religion, perhaps skeptical of their parents, skeptical of authority, whatever. We're talking about a generation That has, in many instances, walked away from the church or at least organized religion and what that's about and what it may mean for the generations after that. And we're going to talk to some young people throughout the course of the broadcast and get their perspective firsthand. World Religion News did an article that was dated the 12th of March, 2014, Religion Declining Among America's Youth. More and more American youngsters are turning away from the religious faith they were born into. While some refuse to attribute the trend to any particular workings of religious institutions, others blame it on the increasing politicization of religion during recent years and the stance of religious politicians on issues such as gay marriages, abortion, contraception, and premarital sex. A January 2012 survey conducted by the Pew Research Center for the People and the Press, showed that 32% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 considered themselves as being unaffiliated with any religious faith. Now, I want to stop. That's not atheist, necessarily. They may believe in some sort of a spiritual power, but they are not affiliating with a specific religious faith. A lot of atheists in there, but we want to be fair. The same survey showed that 21% of Americans between the ages of 30 and 49, 15% between the ages of 50 and 65, and only 9% above 65 considered themselves religiously unaffiliated. So the older demographic is actually more religious. We're seeing a game change happening with the 29 and under crowd. In its report, Pew refrains from attributing the general softening of religious commitment in America to any specific factor or even a few. Nevertheless, the survey shows that religion holds much less influence in the American daily life than it used to. And just an interesting side note here, just a few paragraphs down. Similarly, an interesting Gallup poll study of American voter trends performed from 1937 until 2012 shows an astonishing change in attitudes toward atheist politicians. Back in 1958, only 18% of Americans said they would consider voting an atheist into the Oval Office. That's 18%. That actually still seems high for 1958. In 2012, the number was up by 36 to a 54% majority. And I think we're seeing a reflection of that with all these millennials who are fans of Bernie Sanders, right? Bernie Sanders, he's been you know, rather coy about the religion question, but anybody looking at him sees a secular guy. And yet he has done pretty damn well this year. And young people are a big part of that. Overall, the younger American generation seem to be increasingly moving away from religious dogmas, 
preferring a more liberal and secular approach to issues. While stances on homosexuality do seem to be playing a role in pushing the young ones away from the church, there are other factors increasingly adding to the backlash. Stances on issues such as science, climate change, and evolution tend to further diminish religion's credibility among young Americans. And again, this article is called Religion Declining Among America's Youth, dated 12th of March, 2014. And to the switchboard, area code 507, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Abby. Hi, Abby. The subject today is free-thinking young people. So tell me your story. What's up? All right. Well, um, I guess I, I went to kindergarten to 12th grade at a very Catholic elementary, middle, and high school in a small town in southern Minnesota. My family is Catholic. Everyone I know is Catholic. Actually, it the whole town is just so, like, white and, like, just not diverse <laughs> at all. So uh, I didn't have exposure to anything. And so um, last year, I'm, I'm a first-year student at University of Minnesota now. Last year... I was in religion class, actually, and it was just getting ridiculous. We were talking about uh, the sacraments, and it, we were just talking about, like, the nitpicky details of all of the, the religion stuff, and I was just starting to, like, question things. And so I was, like, looking around, and I was more so interested in, like, the intellectual aspect of things besides religion than atheism, actually. So I kind of came across your podcast, and so... That's why I'm here today, I guess. Wait a minute. You were still somewhat religious when you started listening to the show? Yes, I was. <laughs> and was it the conversations we had here on the radio that helped you sort of, I mean, did you walk away? Are you are you a theist in some way, or where are you now? Uh, right now, I think of myself more so as just like a, a overall a skeptic. I don't really... I don't really identify with the tradition or anything at all. You haven't branded yourself or labeled yourself in some way. You're still on the journey kind of thing, right? Definitely, yeah. Right. I think, I mean, that's probably appropriate to a great many of us. If God shows up tomorrow, yeah. we would want to know that, whatever the evidence <laughs> probably. says. Probably. Yeah. Um, you know, my dad's from a small town in Minnesota. We'd go up there just off the subject real fast. And yeah. it's absolutely gorgeous unless it's summertime and you hate mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> that's accurate, yeah. We'd go up to the lake and go, we'd go fishing for a walleye up there, you know. Uh, we'd go mm -hmm. fishing for northerns and for a walleye up north. And I'll tell you, you know, when the sun goes down, those mosquitoes come out and they're just, they're just everywhere, you know. It's, that's why they <laughs> yeah, call they it the do. Minnesota State Bird, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And we say, what the heck's going on? Except we don't say heck, if you know what I mean. And I think you do. The, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, hey, I think I do. I got just, you I'm just there. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mom and dad have any idea you're on this journey or what? Uh, no, actually, they have no idea. My, my, all my family, they, they don't really, they don't, I think my dad asked me, he's more so the one who would take us to church when I was little and he asked me last summer, he's like, so, uh, you think you're going to find your way to a nice church there? And I'm like, you know, dad, would it really be college if I didn't explore a little bit and, uh, he was disappointed, but I think he, he kind of gets it. But, Probably a you know, little terrified, think... too, when you're a college <laughs> student and you say words like experiment or explore or whatever <laughs> word we use, right? And they're like, oh, and we think about ourselves in college and we're like, okay, you know, just be safe, yeah. make good choices, all that stuff. Right, you know? yeah. But um, yeah, uh, to the, I haven't, I, in the town I'm in, I haven't seen the inside of the Catholic Church or any church for that matter. So it's been definitely a an experience one thing about hearing dad talk about minnesota it's um the catholics and the lutherans they're like the hatfields <laughs> yeah. and the mccoys i mean it's that just true they're always throwing stones over the fence at each other you know oh my mm -hmm. god oh you're lutheran oh you know that's just horrible oh you're catholic yeah. oh that's just terrible you know um, yeah i actually i was at a bookstore or a book sale earlier this year and i found this little lexicon of uh, Lutheran versus Catholic things, and it was like, you say that it's like kind of a you say tomato, I say tomato kind of thing, you know, with Catholics and Lutherans, and it was just really funny. I have that. <laughs> be nice if God had just come down and clear it all up, right? Say oh, these people are nice? right. 
these people are wrong or this is accurate, this is not. This is what I I said, this is what I meant. It really would solve a lot of problems if Jesus himself, yeah, Yahweh or whoever, just took five minutes and just sort of said something, don't you think? Mm-hmm, yeah. Do you miss the idea of going to church? Do you miss being in Sunday assembly or whatever? Um, sometimes, sometimes I do. I, when I'm at school, I, I don't go home very often, but sometimes I'm like, yeah, this weekend when I'm home, I think I'll go to church just for, you know, an intellectual experience. But, uh, I, I never, I never do. And when I had to go for Christmas and it was just a really, you know, it, wasn't comforting like I was expecting it to be. What was and it like I'm if not, it wasn't comforting for you? It was it was really scary actually, just because of some of the things they're saying and some of the the narrow minded things that like you know, I don't a lot of the things they say that I've learned a lot, I've studied a lot with like missionaries and stuff here at college and how they're kind of, you know, sometimes they tend to have an agenda more so than being for the greater good. And uh, there's like a second collection taken up the weekend I was there for a missionary. And it kind of, it bothers me because so many people, they don't, they're just, they're such sheep, you know, being led. And they, they have no idea what's going on. Do you envision ever having some kind of a heart to heart with mom and dad? Hey, look, I'm, you know, I'm, my journey is taking me perhaps in a different direction than you have taken kind of thing, or are you just going to play it close to the vest? Um, I, I don't see it in the near future. My, my grandparents are kind of, especially on my dad's side, they're very religious. And until they're, you know, until they've moved on to whatever's next, I don't think I'm going to bring it up because they don't need that. So the cost benefit probably for you to a degree. And, and I'm, I always encourage people if whoever you are, if you can, you should be who you are, loud and proud, you know. But I also yeah. understand the familial consequences. It's not as easy for some as it is to others. And yeah. so you're sort of playing chess, not checkers, right? You're playing a longer game. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, honestly, at the end of the day, was it Jefferson? I'm trying to think of the quote who said something along the lines of, if there was a worthy God, he would rather us question him than you know, be allegiant out of fear. I know yeah. I butchered the quote, but I'm looking at the idea, the concept. <laughs> a worthy deity doesn't mind our questions, doesn't mind us saying, hey, please prove it to me because I want to live a truthful life and won't yeah. judge us for being the fallible humans that we were supposedly created to be. So for you, that's just what I hope for you is a, a truthful life, you know, a, an honest life lived on your terms. Yeah. Sounds pretty good. Sounds excellent. Well, all my best in your studies up there, and uh, we'll think of you next time we cross the state line up there and go fishing for walleye, okay? All right. Sounds great. Thank you. You take care of yourself. Yep, you too. Thanks. Bye. Here's a message that was sent in by Brianne. She said, I live up here in Alberta, Canada. I'm lucky enough to have parents who grew up only loosely held into religion who decided it was best to let my little brother and I make our own decisions about our religious beliefs. I have many friends who identify as non-religious in some capacity in my Polytech University, while a couple others believe, well, I think there's a God or gods, but I don't need to pray to them all the time, they just are. I think the biggest problem facing the youth today is our parents teaching us not to speak our mind if we might offend. Don't talk about controversial topics in public, someone might hurt or kill you because of it. I've always been a very passionate person who believes that people can believe whatever they want to believe so long as they don't harm anyone or use it to manipulate others. However, I also believe in having open and honest conversations and answering questions. I love debates and I love to learn, but that means that I talk about controversial things to get people involved and giving their opinions, especially if they differ. Yet this rarely happens, so the topic is shut down for fear of offending someone. We get nowhere if we can't speak our minds and have open, honest, and safe conversations. Now, if someone becomes vulgar and offensive, I will end the conversation, obviously. But if someone feels like we used a term incorrectly or that we've misrepresented part of their beliefs, I want them to come and join the conversation. Let me know where I was wrong 
and let me correct myself. Our fear of offending is stopping us from learning, and I think that's the biggest thing holding us back as a generation. While we can be so honest on the internet, we can't always trust the information to be truly coming from someone involved in the religion. Thank you. If you read this, I love your show so much. Keep up the good work, Brianne. Hey, thanks so much for the message, Brianne. Much appreciated. I've got Benny on Skype. Thanks for calling the Thinking Atheist radio broadcast. How's it going? Hi there. It's going well. You are an atheist youth? Yes, I am. Lifelong or what? Well, I was raised Catholic by my family, and my family is the kind of Catholic family that, I mean, look, just take my grandmother, who I live with. She's not a practicing Catholic. She doesn't do the communion and confirmation or any of the rituals, but she believes, unshakably believes, in the Catholic doctrine. So I, w- I was raised in the Catholic family, and around, it was it was in middle school that I really started to question it and break free of that and my my family's been uh, iffy about that but it, it, it's what it is so is she afraid not to believe grandma or does she really enjoy being a, a catholic i think it's just what she's always done and it's the same with with the rest of my family i did the general idea is that oh this it's been we we've my my grandmother was raised by an Italian Catholic and an Italian Jew and if you wonder why our family's a little messed up that I think there's your answer <laughs> but the just the the idea that oh this is how things have always been done this is it's gone back our family's gone for two hundred years and we haven't had any problems cough cough yes we have but 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 you know oh we all believe right. This is what we all do. Why wouldn't you want to be a part of it, right? This is just makes sense, you know? God said it, I believe it, I believe in God, and God believes in me. So, I mean, what are you're on the family radar to a degree then, right? Are you kind of a pet project, or do they just think this is a phase, or what? Oh, I'm... I think they've gotten by now. Since I, I, I said that I was an atheist, I came out as an atheist in seventh grade, I think. And now, I mean, now I'm a senior in high school. I know I sound 12, but I'm 18. (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking you're actually a great communicator and a great storyteller. But seventh grade is pretty hardcore for a Catholic family. I mean, you know, to make that choice and to say it outright, you know. Yeah, that 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 messed with them a little bit. And I, I want to be in broadcasting like you. So thank you very much for that. Well, I, I'm not sure what I've done, but you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> um, no, I, I think you know, this is a movement that needs communicators and storytellers. And so if you've got something to say, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So my generation was certainly more, well, in many cases, more fundamentalist as a whole. At least I heard a lot more hell teaching then than you hear in like, you know, today's Joel Osteen churches and whatnot. Was there some hell teaching in your family? Oh, yeah. You know, you know, because this, because this world, <laughs> this world's going, let me tell you, let me tell you, Seth, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. So, you know, all we need is our, we need people who believe in God. We need them in politics. We need them in the schools. We need them everywhere. That's the same shit they were telling us when I was 18 years old. You know, it's, <laughs> hey, these are the end days, man. You know, we really need representatives for God. Pick a God, whichever God happened to be the God our parents believed in, you know. We need a representative for God to be involved in our culture, to be wired in politically, to vote, to be game changers for the future, you know, (laughs) for the generations to come. So you grew up with that kind of language. Yeah, and when you grow up, you you hear it, and it, it, it makes sense when it comes in that in that from that perspective you know all you see on the news back in my day you know we didn't see all these schools and all these schools getting shot up and all these politicians doing all these crazy things because that of course never ever happened and that's because all we're we're keeping god out of the schools keeping god out of the government keeping god out of everything and then and then you know this is is what's going to happen and if we did that is how it keeps happening then we all going to hell but you realize that um, I come from a generation where our telephones were hardwired into the wall. I know. I can't believe that. I know. It's terrifying. And we had three television channels. Three? Know, and, oh. we, we, we had, well, four if you count public television, if you count PBS, which oh, we didn't PBS. at the time. 
You know, we, we look back at a time before the information age had connected the world, mm-hmm. when it was easier to isolate people, young, old, whatever. It was easier to sort of cordon them off from good information. You're growing up at a time when anyone says anything for any reason, you're five seconds away from a Google search to check it. It's just awesome. I envy you, Benny. <laughs> it, it is. It's it's great. It's it's growing up. I think the one thing that that our generation doesn't, and I, I include myself in this absolutely, doesn't quite understand is how vastly different everything was. Just knowing instantly, like my phone is three feet away from me right now. It's charging because I don't have any battery because I was just watching Michigan State lose and my bracket fall apart. <laughs> but but I can like because for just to take another example, I in school, in religion school, I went once a week Oh, because you got to go to religion school because you got to make your confirmation. So God knows you're looking out for him. Uh, oh, yeah, because he needs the help. I you learn, you know, oh, you know, because in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, it says that Adam was there and Adam needed a mate. Adam needed a woman. So God took the rib out of Adam and then put it in Eve and Eve made Eve and made. The, and that's why you know this. That's why women have one more rib than men. No, oh, they <laughs> don't. <laughs> no, they don't. Google.com, the greatest website there is. Hey, Benny, when you say religion school, what are you talking about? I've heard Catholic school. I just don't recall hearing somebody just say, we had to go to religion school. What are you talking about? Oh, this, um, I don't know if this is a regional thing or if this is just certain denominational thing, but in Long Island, how it was, was because because unless you went to a private school, a Catholic school or a or a, a Lutheran school or a Presbyterian school, and I have friends that go to Catholic school today, but in, if you didn't go to Catholic school and you were a Catholic, and most people in my part of Long Island are Catholic, you would go to what what they called religion school. And what it is is once a week, you go to the church, you stay there for an hour, you learn about how you're going to hell. And you go home. And then at the end of it, you, you get to make your confirmation, which means that, uh, th- that that God says, okay, maybe you're not going to hell, which is a great reward. Well, I can see where the Catholic guilt comes from. They just. Oh, my goodness. They it, lay it on thick. Yeah. So this point in your life, you're looking at college. You're looking at entering the workplace. I mean, are you are you thinking of integrating into the activism thing? I mean, what's your life yes. look like, Benny? It's. It's a it, it's a really it, it's tough to see where where my future is, and I, I, I take it one day at a time. I think that um I I I want there to be some I want there to be a push for uh, I guess the rational movement. I don't know. What. No, I mean I get it. I think we everybody knows what you're talking about. It's it, hard. I, I'm not. I hope this doesn't come off as patronizing because I just had this conversation with. The children in my own home, they're not children, they're 18 and 21. Mm-hmm. But, you know, she's a first year college, 18 years old, pushing 19. And everybody and their dog is like, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And I think to myself, how many people know what they want to do and be <laughs> when they're 18? Before you know, they've just sort of, they're emerging into this whole other chapter. They, they haven't even really navigated those waters. And yet all these sort of college counselor types are looking you in the eyes and expecting you to automatically know your mind and heart for the next 50 years. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, I'll answer your question. I don't know if you meant it as a question or just rhetorical, but I'll answer it. How many kids my age know what they're doing? I'll give you an answer. It's zero. And I've told you that I want to be in. I want to be in broadcasting. I said, "Oh, I from day one, I want to be a game show host." You know, you've won a brand new car. <laughs> but I swear, I swear to God, I was two years old. Swear to God, yeah, yeah it's a Catholic guilt. No, that's all right. I do it all the time. Two it's years fine. old, it's fine. and I, I still do the sign of the cross too. Uh, two years old, I was I, I was watching The Price Is Right, right with Grandma. So so I'm watching the show, and they say, you just won a Chevy Silverado. And guess what I was saying for the next two months to everyone we saw on the street? You oh, just won a Chevy Silverado. 
When I was growing up, it was uh, I was I loved. It. I think it was the American Top Forty with Casey Kasem, the disc jockey, oh. and it's like you know. <laughs> and now it's time for another long distance dedication. You know, we was always trying to mimic. I, mean, I do a terrible impression, but he was the guy I wanted to be. You know, but it's hard when people expect you to to have a template for the rest of your life, when in many cases, they didn't even have a template for their own lives. What is it, 70% of the people who graduate from college end up working in a job outside their degree anyway? You know, who knows what the future holds? So here you are, a non-believer, a skeptic in a family and a sort of a culture of believers. What's your perspective on the believer? I mean, do you look at them with pity? Are you, do you think they're out of their mind? I mean, what's going on in your head? It's hard to be... It's hard to be unbiased and unfiltered, but but yeah, you have to try to and and to see the believer, someone who probably grew up in the faith, someone who knew it, and it's just what's normal. And I know what the feeling is like to just feel normal. And this is growing up. This is what you do. This is what we believe. This is what's true. And this is what you do. This is what you believe. And this is what's true. And some people they go through life and they just don't challenge it. And some people challenge their beliefs and change their beliefs. And I think the the real important thing for anyone of any belief, for any anything, not just in religion, but for anything, is just to look critically. Just to think, does my logic, does my belief hold up? Examine the evidence, see what makes sense. And I, in my old school, I I lived in Long Island, New York for 16 years, and now I'm in Pennsylvania. Uh, But in my old school, there was a Muslim girl. I was great great friends with her. And she was exactly the kind of person that I would like to talk to. She was the person who would go out there, and she'd say, all right, prove me wrong. And she would go out there, and she'd examine the evidence, and she did for a while in her life. And she struggled with her faith, and it came to the end of it, and she's still a Muslim. What, what can I say to that? That's it. You've done, you've challenged yourself. You've gotten to your conclusion. I'm happy with that. Well, there's a good chance, too, that the seeds you planted during those discussions, I mean, they're continuing to grow under the surface. You know, she may be 30 someday, and finally she decides she's going to take an honest look at the, you know, at the stuff she started to examine back in her teens. Yeah. You just never yeah. know when that stuff's going to bear fruit. I. The phrasing I like to use is they're victims of bad ideas, and we can replace bad ideas with better ideas, and I think that's a laudable goal. And uh, I think you've got a lot to contribute to the conversation, Benny. You've been a very entertaining call. I'm glad to see an atheist or a rationalist youth out there who's making a difference. When do you graduate? Just a few weeks, right? No, I know. In June, I'm going to graduate. All right. Well, congratulations on running the gauntlet and making it through. (laughs) And whatever your future holds, I'm sure bright things are in store. Thanks a bunch, Benny. You got it. Have a good one. Here's one from Saudi Arabia. I'm a 16-year-old atheist living in Saudi Arabia in an extremely religious Sunni family. So my journey from religion to reason is something I find very interesting to study. Learning why I'm this way against all odds and wondering how many people around me are also non-believers. I remember having always asked uncomfortable questions and often getting threats of hell and warnings and other unsatisfactory responses having often frightened me. I was always frightened to think, a crippling fear of eventually leaving Islam and ending up in hell. Sometimes I would compulsively just pray many times a day begging God to make me stop having those evil thoughts and keep me Muslim. The Quran explicitly says that God controls your will. That didn't work. I was still too curious. Evolution was something I've been fascinated by. Sometimes I would watch documentaries and debates about evolution for many hours. Eventually, I accepted that reality and was drifting away from my conservative roots by that time. In 2014... Having so much doubt and misgivings about some of the truly horrendous things in the Quran, I decided to read the whole book and decide whether it could be the Word of God. What I found was something I'd known little about. Ethnic cleansing, racism, outrageous misogyny, normalization of pedophilia. That was enough for me to be absolutely disgusted and thought that even if God existed, He's nothing that's worthy of my praise, no matter what threats he makes. Now I'm happier as an atheist. 
It's such a freeing realization that I can now think freely and be critical of anything and accepting all that I am and all that I might become. Thank you so much for the message. Greatly appreciated. Man, it's got to be rough there in Saudi Arabia, being an atheist, being you know, a, a critic of Islam. They just, uh, in recent days, have been talking about this new documentary that has come out called Saudi Arabia Uncovered. It shows the lady who was beheaded in the street, screaming, I didn't do it, and these headless corpses hanging from ropes or cables in full view of the public, just savagery everywhere. Documentary apparently talks about a public space that they refer to as Chop Chop Square because so many people have had their heads cut off there. This is not an environment that tolerates discourse, you know. Anyway, I haven't seen the documentary, but I'm hugely curious about it. And it's been making news in recent days. Area code 920, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. What's your name? This is Taylor Desdell. Taylor, how old are you? I am 15. Well, tell me your story. You're an atheist, you're a skeptic, you're a cynic. I mean, what are you? I consider myself atheist, but I don't completely deny that there a chance that there could be a God. I just think it's highly unlikely, which I think most atheists do. So, Extremely highly unlikely is, <laughs> yeah. depending on the atheist you talk to, David Silverman's book, Fighting God, I know he was making the case that we don't go around and making these kinds of equivocations in relation to Santa Claus or Thor or something, but we seem to be a little more deferential when it comes to God with a capital G, you know, or some higher power, some supreme being. Did you ever believe in your life, ever? I did, but it was, I don't know if you could really call it believing, because I went to a church when I was pretty young. My mom got me baptized, and then after baptism, we didn't really go to church anymore, but I still kind of believed. I didn't know too much about the religion itself. Does anybody at your school know that you are an atheist? Oh, yeah. I try and keep it a secret. Um, most of my friends, well, my um, main group of friends at school are atheists as well. So we kind of talk about that, like at the lunch table. Is it a small group of people who feel like they kind of have to stick together, or is it like that? It's kind of like that, but I have some other friends. They're not. Um, they don't outright say they're atheists. They don't outright say they're Christian. Well, tell me about your generation. Tell me about, you know, the freshmen in your school. Is religion even um, on their radar? Do they care about church? Oh, yeah. Do they read the Bible? Are they checked out? What? Oh, yeah. They, um, here last year, we were in a science class, eighth grade, and we were talking about the Big Bang, and it was towards the end of the year. We weren't, we didn't really get too much into the topic at all. But there was a bunch of kids that were like shouting, like it's not real, like they were being obnoxious. And the teacher, she was like, "I believe in God. You don't have to keep saying that." So that kind of bugged me. This year, there was a teacher. It's actually pretty funny. Here she was talking about how she prays like like she said don't you ever just ask for something from god and then you regret it and then people were like nodding their heads and i was just sitting there shaking my head and then she was like yeah we've all had those moments wait have you ever asked for something from god and then come to regret it yes that's what she said why would like, you regret um, it i mean well, i'm not sure i understand well, what her reasoning was well, I guess I should have elaborated. She meant like um, when people pray and then they say, oh, God, give me five grand and I'll make it up to you or something like that. When people haven't fully considered the implications of their request, you know, be careful what you wish for kind of thing, huh? Yeah. I know it can't always be easy for a free thinker in high school, but um, I wish you the best and... Congratulations on making it, almost making it through your freshman year, and 
I hope the next three years of high school are great for you, and I hope you get a chance to sort of engage in some great conversations about this kind of stuff with the people next to you, you know? So all my best, my friend. Okay, thank you. To cap our discussion tonight about skeptical youth, I thought it would be appropriate to spend a few minutes on the radio with August Brunsman, the executive director of the SSA, the Secular Student Alliance. August, good to have you. How's it going, man? It's going very well, Seth. Thanks so much for having me on. Reading about the SSA all the time, and I just smile. You guys post the photographs from your annual events, the big convention that you have, and there's hundreds of young faces representing sort of a secular future, and I can't help but just feel a swell of pride, you know? <laughs> so, Great. I'm delighted to hear that. Yeah, I feel the same way. It's uh, really uh, been, ha, to to pardon the expression, I feel I live a, a blessed life to be able to empower so many young people to actually, like, live their identity. Hey, August, what do you think accounts for the rise of the nuns, the non-religious? Well, two things. The internet overall, I think, is uh, is huge. And there's actually, there's a study, it's a couple of years old now, there's a study out of MIT that basically showed a really strong correlation between access to the internet and decline in religiosity. Uh, so I think the internet is actually the biggest thing. And then sort of like paired with that is this trend that's been going on. Well, I don't know how long it's been going on. It's been documented since at least the 70s and actually I think a little bit before that, which is this generational shift. If you look at people's religious attitudes or answers to the question, like, what is your religion? Like, within a generation, if you ask somebody born in, say, the 50s, like, if you ask them in 1960, you ask them in 1970, you ask them in 1980, individuals will change, but sort of the overall population, they just get a tiny, tiny bit less religious. Uh, so I think that transfer of belief is just getting, um, it's not happening because I think this, the, <laughs> the truth is out there, right? Like it's too easy to go and Google all sorts of things about like, did Jesus rise from the dead? What are, you know, problems with all kinds of things in theology? It's too easy to have that conversation now and people are interested in fact checking and it's just, you know, you could just pull out your phone and fact check all these things. Whereas that was, you know, not possible even when I was a kid. What is the Secular Student Alliance? Is it high school? Is it college? Is it both? Give me a definition here. Sure. So we support a network of high school and college groups that are all about advancing secular values. So those are values that don't make assumptions about the supernatural, that want to have us update our beliefs based on what we see and what we experience, and have a concern for the present and future world. So if groups agree with those things, then we want to support them. Um, and now, still, somebody has yeah. started a church group in a, in a school, and we protest because of the church state line. How does the SSA play into all that? Here's the thing. So we are not about shutting down anybody else's speech. And I am a firm believer that, um, and maybe, you know, whatever, we can dream up some really wild exceptions here. But, like, by and large, the solution to speech we don't like is more speech. So if there's like an outside group that is having adults go in and uh, set up a group you know, in a public school, that's one thing that needs to be addressed. And honestly, like we don't have a legal team. We partner with other organizations, which, uh, you know, if you look at the nonprofit world in general, there's this enormous move towards networks instead of like, you know, shops that try to do everything. So we work with FFRF, we are Freedom from Religion Foundation. We work with the American Humanist Association. We work with American atheists to refer those things over if that's actually going on. We're the other side of the coin. We are the more speech side of the coin. We are the, well, it turns out the Equal Access Act, which was pushed through by the religious right, which basically says that student-led groups that are extracurricular in public schools, when managing those, if a school's going to have them, the school has to be viewpoint neutral. And that means that, yes, it is the case that Christian athletes can go and form a group as long as it's student-led, but so can the Secular Student Alliance. So we're there supporting those high schoolers and also, you know, college students, although uh, at public universities, we see far less resistance than at the high schools where there's still quite a bit of resistance. But we're there, you know, just sort of basically like making it more convenient 
to run a group. It turns out it's actually a lot of work and you're not born knowing how to do this. So we have, you know, we've got staff who will help people out. We've got a speakers bureau. We have our, you've mentioned a couple times already, our really fantastic annual conference, which is in Columbus, Ohio, July 8th through the 10th uh, this year. You can learn all kinds of details and register at secularstudents.org. And there will definitely, there is stuff there for everybody. So even if you're not a student leader, I strongly encourage you to come because you can get connected with these amazing students all over the country. And you can also learn a lot because there's a lot of activism stuff that we teach there that like is valuable on the campus and off the campus. If somebody doesn't have an SSA at their school, they're thinking, well, crap, how do I get one? What do, how come I don't have one kind of thing? What do you tell them? <laughs> well, you don't have one because you haven't started one yet. Go to secularstudents.org and there's a button on the right side of the web page that says start a group. And there's instructions right there. And uh, Tori, who's our group starting specialist, will help you out. Uh, she'll take you through all the steps. She'll send out a packet to you that has flyers and thumbtacks. You don't even have to go to the drugstore to buy thumbtacks. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how easy it is to get your group off, off the ground. Uh, yeah, we're super, super happy to help you and to help find others who want to start a group at your school. Thousands of students over the years have started SSA groups, and you can be another one. August, I have heard rumors that you were a man of tireless energy and just these few minutes on the phone, I can just tell you're, do you sleep is my first question. Or, you know, are you, are you always in motion? Because I kind of get that vibe about you, man. I keep myself pretty busy. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'll make sure and also include a link to the SSA in the description box of this broadcast. I love you guys. And uh, I'm happy to support what you're about. And you just keep us abreast of whatever's happening at the SSA moving forward. And we'll watch this generation do things that you and I may have never previously imagined. Going to be amazing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, our our children and grandchildren will do things that would stagger us. I can't wait to see it all. Thanks for being a part of the show, man. It's great to have you. Thanks so much, Seth. Take care. Next Tuesday, it's Homeschool Cults Part 1. Prepare yourself. Prepare your mind for the meltdown because it's going to be intense. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you in just a few days. Take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com